Okay. Uh, all right. I guess we are live now. Um, yeah, I'm checking on the website. That looks good. So let me see. All right. I guess, yeah, the sound is also fine. I'm assuming that we can, can probably get started. All right. So then, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today is uh, is basically the second lecture of our PNS uh, genomics course, and uh, in this lecture, we're going to slide the delve into to the uh, basics of genome analysis. Uh, so I'm going to be providing a little bit more details of of the steps in genome analysis. Uh, uh, basically more details than what we covered in the in the previous lecture. Um, so yeah, I guess with that, we can get started. Um, by the way, if you have uh, any questions, uh, feel free to uh, ask them uh, on YouTube. I'll basically try to uh, check them uh, and, and basically answer them. Uh, uh, after after the lectures, right? Uh, yeah, let's get started. Then. Uh, all right. So our agenda for today is uh, the brief, basically uh, introduction to the to the ways that we uh, take to analyze the genomes, and then I'll uh, try to give you an idea of what an intelligent genome analysis can be. So. I guess, so let's also take an even uh, uh, further step back and then think about basically the goal of computing uh, that we're doing today, right? So so what we are essentially trying to achieve with, with computing. Well, nowadays, I guess there are many ways of, many reasons to do computation, I assume, especially, right, for, for the popular cases, even the entertainment, uh, is is uh, is one reason to do computation, but I guess we should for now limit ourselves for uh, scientific purposes. And if we think about those purposes, uh, what we can perhaps tell is that the purpose of computing, at least according to Richard Hamming, which I also agree, the purpose of computing is actually to gain insight, not numbers. Basically, the computers will tell us will give us some numbers based on, let's say, the numeric calculations that, that it's doing, but we don't, we don't really want to just see those numbers, right? What we want to do is we want to gain insight. We want to generate answers from these answers by, by uh, um, from these numbers by doing the computation. So this is essentially um, perhaps a general definition of, of the reason of let's say scientific computing uh, nowadays. And basically uh, even today, this is actually even a bigger problem because we need to basically gain insights and observations from these numbers much more efficiently than ever before. So this is because we're generating lots of and lots of data today. And this actually, the number of the, the, the amount of data that we're generating is increasing uh, day by day. So when you basically uh, think of these use cases such as astronomy or social media like YouTube or X, or even the genomics data that we're interested in this course is generating lots of lots of data. And this data is actually even perhaps faster than uh, we can process. Uh, the, the, the basic speed of data, data generation is faster than, than the speed of basically uh, the, the technologies are evolving. And I'm saying this because right now, like we're even seeing a shift today in the industry from, let's say, uh, from the era of nanometers, right, to the era of angstrom. But this is even smaller than a one nanometer. And Intel is actually pushing towards that limit 
to basically even fit even more transistors to to uh, to to achieve let's say let's say high performance and even maybe uh, more energy efficient uh, computing however we have basically a huge problem the problem is uh, so when we think of these important applications like genomics and as you already know this is basically an illustration of one of these uh, sequencing machines like the illumina machine right so these machines although they are they are generating really important data they are essentially special purpose machines for data generation not not to analyze the data right and they are really fast uh, uh, to to generate that data and essentially the problem is that when we try to use a, a general purpose machine to analyze such a data these machines are really not specifically designed to, to analyze this specific particular type of uh, data generated from a particular machine, right? So that, and this way, they become really slow to analyze this data and they usually become, uh, they are essentially basically bottlenecked by uh, the, the, the data movement uh, overheads. Uh, so basically, uh, what we have today is, is a slow and inefficient processing capability uh, that is not cap capable of larger uh, to processing to process large amount of data moment. Uh, right. So and we're interested in this data because uh, th this type of data is usually very important for us. This is this type of data is generated is usually generated from very important applications such that they carry really valuable information or knowledge, right? And then we really want to extract that knowledge from this data uh, by essentially achieving certain goals. So what, are, what can these goals be? Perhaps maybe there can be a latency uh, uh, constraint or performance constraint, or maybe there, there could be some energy uh, constraints or maybe essentially other costs, right? That you can think of uh to to associate with, with with the goals that you want to set for your application and uh so basically uh such a data analysis or such a processing capability is ideally or should ideally be tailored for uh many important applications such as uh, ai ml applications or genomics medicine and health and if you can basically extract such an information extremely efficient by meeting these goals, we can actually call this type of analysis perhaps intelligent data analysis because this can meet all of our goals to, to uh, process uh, the data generated from an important application. And perhaps you're, you're aware, this is actually also one of the key directions, key research directions that we're taking in our uh, research group, which is essentially building architectures for important applications, such as AIML, genomics, medicine, and health. So, but clearly uh, we need a faster, scalable, and accurate genome analysis today for many, many reasons. Uh, for example, this, this type of analysis is needed to understand, let's say, a genetic variations, a species and evolution, in the, in the population, right? So we, we really want to understand this variation so that we can uh, understand, let's say, the, the life score better so that we can improve the quality of life by providing clever solutions to it. Uh, another way of analyzing the genome or why this type of analysis is important is basically, we may also want to predict the presence of relative abundance of microbes in a given sample, right? This can be actually a life critical analysis. If a particular sample perhaps contain an, an uh, uh, really dangerous uh, uh, species, let's say in the sample. So this is also a bit related to achieve rapid surveillance of disease outbreaks, right? If you have, let's say our uh, genome analysis set up uh, ready in many applications and then if you continuously monitor, let's say, such uh, potential outbreaks, 
then we could actually even take actions uh, much more quickly, right? Uh, even before seeing the symptoms from people and understanding that such a symptom can be dangerous for for uh, for human health and 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 the health of other uh, living organisms, essentially. And this this also uh, and and accurate and fast analysis is also important for developing. Uh, personalized medicine because uh, as you may imagine it would be much more efficient and much more let's say precise if you could let's say prescribe uh, a medicine that's extremely tailored for each individual right such as such a medicine has a potential to uh, to basically improve the quality of life for every individual let's say in different ways tailored tailored for that particular individual so then I guess uh, understanding after understanding uh, a genome analysis can be really important to analyze. Let's then cover uh, the basics of the genome, right? So basically what is a genome, right? So because I guess everyone has it, right? Otherwise it literally wouldn't be possible for you to be, I guess, uh, uh, watching this lecture uh, I guess thinking about the ideas and thinking about the question, what is a genome, etc. Right? Uh, all of this possible is because we all carry this, uh, uh, let's say, biological uh, structure that's called genome that makes up even uh, other things. So if we uh, want to have a, a loosey or let's say a high level uh, description, a genome is basically an entire set of DNA sequences in a cell, right? Uh, so we, everyone has uh, basically millions, billions of cells, and inside the cells we have essential DNA. And this is not even just uh, a DNA that's included in your nucleus, which is basically is uh, uh, constructing uh, 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 your chromosomes, let's say, but we also have a mitochondrial DNA in our in our cells, um, so and basically, if we consider the DNA uh, in in its digital form or in the human readable form, this is nothing but, let's say, again loosely, is a series of uh, certain uh, characters, and this character is is basically uh, usually in an alphabet of four letters, right? if you are considering DNA or not. Right. And these four letters are essentially A, T, G, C. Each of them is corresponding to a particular uh, nucleic base or base. Right. So adenine, guanine, cytosine, and, and, and uh, thymine. Uh, and all of these are essentially coming together, makes up uh, uh, the, the living things, essentially, and, and uh, tells basic organisms or provides a structure uh, or the code for organisms uh, so that they know what to do, essentially. So uh, then I guess, like, since this is a series of sequences, you may also wonder how large is it, right? Does it have a limit? Yeah, sure, it has a limit. Uh, then the question is, how large is it, right? I guess to put a perhaps visible uh, comparison, I guess, uh, we can think of this particular building. I'm not sure if we are familiar with this building. This is a building in Zurich. This is uh, Andreas Turm, is uh, located in Orlikon. And actually we have some offices around uh, around the top floors here uh, as a supper research group. And if you really want to co uh, compare, let's say how large a DNA can be, you can perhaps imagine that we write uh, every character in your genome uh, in a letter, and then we keep writing until we finish all your chromosomes, right? So when you do that, what you're going to end up is basically, and also if you place these papers on top of each other, what you're going to end up is that you're going to have a pile of papers that's even longer than the Andreas stream. That's going to be basically around 100 meters, and the Andreas stream is around 75 meters, right? And if you are still basically uh, 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 suspecting that if this is true, I did the math here, so you can check. 
uh, and and see basically this is true. So this is basically puts a, a, a different um, uh, let's say view, right? That's a different concept for us because DNA or genome is huge. There is a huge amount of data to process, and this is even for a single individual. And this is even just generated once, and usually we generate this type of data many, many times for a single individual, right? Maybe 10 times or 30 times for redundancy purposes. So you just imagine the amount of data that we need to process. And uh, I guess when you then understand how large this is, you can also understand how large could it be to uh, uh, construct basically the, the, the complete human reference genome uh, uh, altogether. And this basically has been the effort uh, for the last 30, even 35 years. And uh, the scientists actually started uh, uh, the idea of constructing the full human uh, reference genome uh, in 1990s, and they actually uh, finished this in 2003, around 2003. And this was actually a huge breakthrough. Uh, back in, back in that time, but this was a huge breakthrough because this took a lot of time and took a lot of money. Let's say we uh, 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 basically the institutions spent around three billion dollars to construct the human reference genome, and the way that it was done was it it almost literally similar to writing every character in your genome one by one to a piece of paper. Let's say it's it's not exactly that way, but if you want to basically understand the hardness of the problem, just imagine that you need to write almost every character one by one in the human reference genome for every paper, where basically the length of papers are even larger than a tall building. And imagine that you need to do it for every papers to finish up the human reference genome. And this was a huge breakthrough, but the, cause, uh, the issue, relatively an issue is that Although it was good enough back then, it wasn't complete. We were still missing some parts of the human reference genome uh, up until. So this was the case up until uh, 2021, uh, when basically, as the sequencing technologies uh, improved, it became relatively easier, let's say, or quicker and even cheaper to to build up the reference genomes and. Uh, so in between the, the first generation of the reference genome up until today, we also have been generating other reference genomes and we learned basically how to, how to generate reference genome accurately, faster and cheaper, let's say. And the tools were of course also building and improving uh, within that time. So eventually as we improve things, uh, uh, we were able to finally construct the full human reference genome uh, essentially gapless, uh, 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 the complete human reference genome. And this was done by, uh, this was a basically effort of, of course, many people, uh, but especially uh, uh, led by certain people, as you can see here, um, uh, especially, uh, sorry, especially by uh, Adam Filippi, uh, Alan Eichler, uh, uh, Karen Miga, and Michael uh, Schatz. So these people were also recognized uh, as the um, 100 most influential people of 2022 by Time magazine uh, last year because of the completion of this uh, human reference genome. So you can see high, how high impact this is to complete such a human reference genome because it's extremely important to do so to basically understand the human genome better than, than to develop tools better. So if we keep talking about essentially the human uh, reference genome, but let's also consider to put a, uh, a basically a comparison, let's consider other uh, genomes. So for example, we can start with the viral genomes, right? So viral genomes are uh, essentially usually the smallest, uh, uh, they contain the smallest, genomes in terms of the number of bases uh, that they contain. So some of the viruses are uh, will contain uh, DNA, some of them will contain RNA as their 
uh, let's say, nucleic bases. Um, so let's consider this particular virus. This is uh, uh, 5x174 uh, virus. And the length of it, the length of the bases that it contains is around uh, 5,000 uh, bases. Right. So this virus can infect uh, bacteria, right? It can uh, essentially harm bacteria. In particular, uh, we're talking about uh, E. coli bacteria, uh, bacteria here. So the, bac the size of the bacteria uh, in the case of E. coli is around 5.5 million bases. It's almost 100 uh, times, let's say, larger than the, than the viral uh, genome. <clears throat> so E. coli can also be harmful for human, right? So it, it can be contaminated in, especially in food samples. And if basically those food samples uh, are containing E. coli, and uh, if you basically are infected by this particular uh, E. coli, this can be extremely harmful for you. And essentially E. coli can infect humans as well. And humans have around uh, 3.2 uh billion base uh, uh, uh characters in their in their genomes so i guess there is now a trend maybe you can imagine uh or guess a particular trend here right as the genome size uh, increases maybe the complexity let's say of the human genome uh, of the genome or the life is also increasing right so we we came from uh, the viral genome then moved to bacteria and then moved to human and the uh, genome size was increasing. So is there essentially a correlation between this? <clears throat> and so I would say no, uh, because it's not always the case, basically. So especially when we think about the plant genomes, what we tend to see is that these plant genomes usually contain even longer uh, uh, genomes. For example, an onion, May contain uh, can contain around uh, 16 billion bases. But the question is: Is onion more complex uh, 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 structure than a human being? So that's very, I guess, a subjective question, right? So it depends on how you describe the complexity. If you are talking about the intelligence, perhaps no. But maybe there are other complex levels that we should think of. And even there are even larger. Uh, 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 um, uh, plants, uh, there are basically other plants with larger uh, genomes in this, for example, this uh, uh, particular genome, again, a plant genome contains 150 billion uh, bases, uh, almost 50 times larger than the, than the uh, human genome size. <laughs> and there are basically many reasons for it. It's, there are evolutionary reasons. Some plant genomes are not necessarily deployed genomes, meaning they won't contain a pair of chromosomes from parents, but they may be polyploid, containing essentially many, uh, let's say, copies of a particular chromosome leading to uh, increased size of, of the gene. <clears throat> so uh, having said that, let's also consider this, let's also cover, uh, I guess, the lower levels uh, of, of the genome. So I'll stick to uh, human reference genome for now to keep things simpler. Uh, so human reference genome contains uh, uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes. Uh, one essentially from uh, one parent, the other one is from another parent, basically. And uh, our, uh, the, the, the 22 of these chromosomes coming from one parent uh, are essentially autosomes, meaning they are not correlated with the sex chromosome. So we also ha have a pair of chromosomes known as uh, a sex chromosome. So these are not called autosomes, but rather uh, sex chromosomes. So this is essentially in a high level is a difference. So if you look even more closely, what we're going to see is that this famous uh, double helix structure structure of the of the genome, right? So this is uh, essentially a chromosome, and then the structure of it actually will be even more complex than this. What will so the, the chromosome won't be basically fully opened, uh, meaning it won't always be uh, make these uh, double helix structure completely wide open, 
but rather at certain points it will be, let's say, compressed. And for these compressed regions, we call these regions chromatins, and they are essentially uh, compressed by certain structures such as histones uh, to that will wrap like a roll, basically. Imagine a roll and then we're wrapping uh, uh, your essentially string uh, on that roll. So those are essentially histone in genome. But for the other parts that are, let's say, not compressed and wide open, uh, we can basically see the open structure of this double helix structure of the, of the, of the DNA in this particular case. And those will basically, uh, will also contain uh, certain bases or nucleic bases that we call adenine, thymine, cytosine, and one, essentially. And they will basically bind to each other uh, based on uh, the chemical interactions between them. And as you may know, uh, adenine will bind to thymine and cytosine will bind to guanine and so on from basically in one stand, if you have an uh, adenine, then we can perhaps with a very high confidence uh, say that we have a uh, thymine in the, in the other stand. Uh, so this is basically how in reality it looks like under uh, electron uh, microscope. So this is basically uh, essentially a, a, a particular a pair of chromosomes. So this is basically the centromere region and these regions are telomeres uh, in the chromosome, basically the end joints of the chromosomes, which are particularly hard to, let's say, construct for, I guess, uh, for like, let's say more low level uh, reasons. Uh, but essentially this chromosome will be, in most cases will be compressed, right? Meaning you, like you won't really see the DNA wide open here except for particular regions. So then uh, I guess we can also then try to answer how that DNA is used in real life, right? So I guess we can uh, answer this quickly uh, by uh, describing the central dogma of, of let's say, life or molecular biology. Right? So we have DNAs that's, that it consists of ATGCs and so on, right, uh, in, in uh, both strands. So we have two strands, a one strand, and there's a second strand in DNA. So you can think of, if you want to make an analogy, you can think of this uh, DNA information as a source code. Uh, in, in your, let's say, in the program that you're perhaps, in the code that you're writing. And this source code will not always uh, carry a useful information, let's say. Right? Sometimes it will contain comments, which is useful for you, but not really useful for the machine. Right? It will contain macros, I guess. It will disable that particular source code depending on the flex that it receives. Right, so it has this particular functionality, and but essentially what it tells us, it basically defines uh, the uh, the functionality. It doesn't perform the functionality, but it defines the functionality. But this is also like this is also perhaps the role of DNA. It's defining the source code. Let's say it's defining the functionality, and what happens is that uh, we can transcribe this to uh, an RNA. So the RNA is essentially, is gonna, it's going to be generated from the useful regions of the DNA, it's extremely similar to what would happen if you uh, uh, converted your source code to an assembly or, or a binary, right? Your source code, your, basically your comments or macros, let's say disabled macros, will not be carried out to to the, to the binary, right? Only the useful part will be carried out to the binary. But this is also similar in the case of RNA. So the, this essentially will contain the useful part. So then what happens is that, so once we uh, transcribe the DNA to RNA from the useful parts of the DNA, uh, uh, the other reactions will take into place and then this particular RNA will be converted into a series of amino acids making up the protein uh, structure. And this essentially is what's, let's say, regulating or what's uh, really functioning, let's say, in the, in, the, in the cell. And this is also similar to how your binary would 
be executed on our processor, right? It's, it's now like we now define, we have the binary useful part, but let's now put it into, uh, uh, in, uh, it's basically is telling how the, how the processor should work, I guess, right? So this is now executing something and doing something, it's basically function. So this is the case of also the protein, also it's, it's what's making up the real functions such as the phenotypes. For example, your eye color, your hair color, or uh, essentially how uh, your particular cell uh, regulates itself and so on. So I hope this was uh, clear so far uh, because we're gonna also delve into a little bit more detail about, uh, let's say what's, what's uh, making each cell different, I guess. Right? Because uh, essentially the idea is that uh, the DNA or the genome uh, that we carry in our body will be contained almost in exactly the same way, in the same way uh, in our cells. Right? So this means that uh, most cells in, in our body will have almost the same DNA and the same, let's say, genes. But then if that's the case, like how, how come we have a skin cell and also a liver cell and perhaps, I don't know, like a muscle cell and the other things, right? So how, how do they differ than each other? So this is also, so I'm not going to go back into that uh, lower level. This is essentially initially defined by the signaling uh, early on the development of the, the tissue or the organism, uh, uh, basically in the single cell process or uh, 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 multi-cell process. Uh, so when you're considering the human, this is this is basically happening in the early days of the uh, of of basically when you are just basically a particle like a part of um, a set of cells in in your mother's let's say uh, uh, body, right? Um, so this so this type of signaling uh, in the early days of life will essentially affect. Uh, how uh, genes are going to be expressed in each cell. And so some, so as you may remember, I told you that like the, the DNA is not always fully open. It's in certain places, it's compressed, in certain places it's open, etc. So this also is affecting how each cell is behaving differently. So it's not at certain places, some in some particular cell, like some parts of the DNA will be open, but when you look at in other type of cell, you'll perhaps see that that part is closed. But this will essentially affect how uh, the genes are uh, essentially uh, uh, opened, like switched on or switched off in each cell. And these genes are uh, telling uh, which proteins to generate. And since we can only use the switched on, let's say, genes, we can only generate proteins from, from these parts of the, of the DNA. So then this is literally, this literally means that once you compress and uncompress and for like, once you have like other chemical bindings in your DNA, so I'm just making this a little bit simpler. So this is basically, uh, uh, telling which genes are on and which genes are off. And knowing that, we can also tell, okay, then in this particular cell, we're going to be perhaps generating this particular RNA, and this particular RNA will lead to this particular protein. It will then lead to this particular type of functionality and so on, essentially defining the uh, role of each cell, making up, and then once these cells are close to each other, the signaling between these cells will also affect the functionality and so on. So this is essentially how, how uh, each cell uh, can differ, can differ uh, uh, from each other. Right? And also over time, mutations can occur. We call them uh, somatic mutations, that the ones that are occurring over time. So this may also affect the functionality of the gene. Right? So, for example, if a particular mutation appears on your particular location in your gene, then 
maybe this can switch off that gene, disabling perhaps even synthesis of a particular protein, maybe leading to a particular disease and so on. Uh, so I guess having said that, uh, you perhaps uh, realize it's really important to understand the differences, let's say, uh, between a healthy cell and also a cell that uh, shows a particular phenotype, let's say a particular function. Maybe, let's say in this case, a blood pressure. So perhaps like when you look at the individuals that have a uh, relatively low level of blood, blood pressure, you may categorize a particular region saying that if you have a low blood pressure, then you, you, you're likely to have uh, uh, this type of uh, uh, information in your DNA, meaning perhaps you'll always see T over T if, if you have an LT lower uh, level of um, uh, blood pressure. But maybe due to your particular mutation or maybe the inheritance from your parents, maybe you don't have a T but C over there in, your, in one place of your genome, right? And having that have a, may have a potential to show a particular phenotype. Again, in this case, the blood pressure, maybe this can lead to increase blood pressure just because you have a particular change uh, at a position in your genome. And we call these changes uh, uh, SNPs or uh, single nucleotide polymorphism. So this is essentially telling there is a single uh, change uh, in, the, in the nucleic base compared to some other, let's say, control, controlled genome. So this is another example. So we may uh, be doing essentially a genome-wide association studies. This means that you may gather a group of individuals where they may be relatively healthy, let's say not showing a particular symptom, but then you may also uh, 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 gather a, a group of individuals that's, that like showing uh, a particular symptom. And what you can do is that you can uh, sequence the, uh, the, the genome of all of these individuals and then try to find a correlation, basically, between the synapse and, and the particular symptom that these individuals are showing, right? So perhaps maybe particular, so it's, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, whenever there's a synapse, it will be uh, basically linked to that particular symptom because maybe it may be linked to something else or maybe it may not be linked to anything at all, right? Uh, but then you have this control group of from many individuals and then if you keep seeing, let's say a high level of, uh, uh, let's say um, evidence that the particular synapse or particular mutations are occurring in this particular group of individuals but not occurring in this particular group of individuals, then perhaps you can link that uh, synapse to that symptom saying that, oh, okay, like if you have this SNP or if you have this mutation, then you're likely to have or to show that particular uh, symptom. So as you can see, this is mainly statistical based on the, based on the observations. And uh, if you are interested, you can uh, check and see this paper uh, to understand how uh, this type of study is carried out. And we're also building, let's say, uh, dictionaries uh, that will literally tell you if you have this particular synap, meaning if you have this uh, base, let's say, at, in a chromosome at this particular position in your genome. And if this is a synap, meaning this is not really observed, let's say, in the general population, uh, you can basically check like that there are names for that particular synap, and then you can go and check the dictionaries and then see what that synap having what uh, what may what the, what could it mean basically having that particular synth in your genome so it may tell you that oh like with this particular percentage you're likely to have this uh, particular symptom and so on so we're building this uh, day by day so uh, and this is basically an example from an open SNP, uh, uh database uh, so we don't uh, also uh, ha just have um, single uh, mutations we also have larger mutations, meaning 
maybe a huge portion of your, uh, let's say, genome may be deleted, right? Or maybe it could be inverted or like moved to somewhere else and so on. So you, you may imagine that such large mutation may also lead to uh, particular symptoms. And this is in fact the case I'm understanding. And these variations are usually called structural variations. Uh, and understanding these structural variations are very important to, to understand, let's say the diseases may be linked uh, to, to, to structural variations. And there are some examples here, for example, autism, uh, schizophrenia, uh, obesity, and having been underweight are essentially linked to uh, particular structural variations uh, in your genome. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you are interested, you can also check this paper. So then I guess let's go into the second part of uh, uh, the lecture today, where we'll cover the intelligent genome analysis. So we've uh, loosely mentioned the intelligent genome analysis in the beginning of the lecture, right? We had some goals and we wanted to achieve that and so on. But the question is, and does intelligent genome analysis really matter, let's say? Well, then I guess it depends on what we really want, what we really, uh, we really want to achieve from intelligent genome analysis. So there are some, mm, uh, in a broad level, there are some, I guess, goals that can be set. For example, we may want to achieve uh, fast genome analysis, right? This may be related to the latency or the throughput of the analysis or, or uh, both of them together. For example, you may want to do some real time analysis as the sequencing data is generated. Uh, so this also should, such analysis can be large scale, should be applicable to a large scale, right? Meaning you may want to analyze the entire population uh, and doing so, you don't really want to slow down your analysis a lot. So you just want to have a good scale work that can make it applicable to the larger genomes. And we also want to, of course, have an acute analysis, right? This is important for precision and accuracy reasons. You don't really want to do uh, inaccurate uh, diagnosis of the disease. Uh, in a sense, we you also want to use the right architectures to do our analysis. Doesn't mean that we always want to rely on the general purpose architectures, but perhaps there are uh, better fitting architectures out there that we can use to achieve fast and accurate analysis, like by meeting the energy efficiency constraints and the bandwidth constraints. Yeah, and the other, I guess, criteria is the privacy. We all know that the DNA is a very valuable and sensitive, uh, sensitive asset that we really want to protect. Uh, so that perhaps should be also protected and then uh, to make sure the safety of each individual. And we describe these also steps in this paper. If you are interested, interested in uh, learning more, you can, you can check this paper. So let's go over, I guess, one by one very quickly. Uh, we can start with the past genome analysis, perhaps. So what is what do you mean by past genome analysis? I guess, uh, in general, perhaps past genome analysis should be done in mere seconds uh, using maybe even limited computational resources, for example, personal computer or a mobile device. So this is basically one example of past genome analysis. And we want to do this because uh, this, such, a, such, that such type of de decision or analysis can be really life critical. For example, uh, um, so this is actually uh, coming down, down in the UK right now. If you, if we, how basically critically ill infants and newborns, it's essentially required to have a, a whole genome analysis of, of these infants. And this is actually also known as rapid, rapid uh, whole genome sequencing or RWGS. Uh, whole genome sequencing would mean you're sequencing the entire genome. Uh, and this essentially means that we want to do this analysis extremely quickly of course, because this is life critical and then some efforts should be given uh, extremely fast. And as I said, uh, from 2019 and on, all seriously ill children in the UK uh, will be offered a whole genome sequencing as part of their care. 
this is extremely important to understand certain uh, issues or diseases uh, for certain illnesses, right? To, to diagnose them quickly. And also this is useful to, uh, uh, sequencing of genome analysis is useful for uh, rapid surveillance of disease outbreaks. Uh, we can essentially use it, for example, to uh, Zika virus uh, to avoid its spread in, in a certain community. And this was actually done and used uh, previously in 2017 using nanopore sequencing. Uh, so this is another example essentially uh, for uh, Ebola virus. And this is uh, uh, finally done for um, also the COVID-19. Uh, so if you remember, I guess, uh, during the COVID-19 outbreak, it was extremely common to do uh, PCR testing. So PCR testing is of course extremely reliable. Uh, it's showing, providing us extremely reliable results, but this is only possible for non regions to target. So if you don't know the region to target, then you cannot really design a PCR. So you should first know which targets, uh, which regions to target so that you can design your PCR. So this means that there is actually a high latency uh, to get the right answer. And it is hard to customize to any region, let's say. So I'm seeing high latency because when you give the sample, there's usually a few hours that you need to wait to, to get your answer. And uh, ideally this can also be done. This could be done uh, using uh, uh, sequencing techniques. Again, in this particular example, uh, nanopore sequencing so that uh, you can give answers basically uh, whether a particular sample is contaminated by a, a, a COVID virus or not uh, doing some DNA sequence. So the other aspect was the large-scale analysis, if you may remember. So our goal in this large-scale analysis is basically to understand, for example, what organisms are present in a given environment and how uh, abundant they are. Uh, this is important, essentially, to understand the other living cells uh, that are essentially uh, living with us, right? Uh, and it's important to understand them uh, so that maybe some of these microbiomes, some of these uh, organisms may perhaps may be harmful for the human health. Um, the other way of doing this large scale analysis is a population uh, scale analysis, right? So we may essentially took a particular population in this case, uh, in this particular example, we take, for example, 50,000 individual and we want to sequence their DNA and then analyze their genome. And in this case, such an analysis, uh, population scale analysis takes uh, 83 CPU hours per sample. So if you multiply this by 50,000, this is equivalent to 4.50 million CPRs. So this means that like, for example, if you have a server uh, with perhaps CPUs uh, of size, let's say 84 CPUs or 64 CPUs, this is roughly taking one hour, let's say per sample. And even in, in such a server, it will take 50,000 hours to get the entire answer, right? And we're even talking about this larger, uh, such a large scale CPU to do such uh, a population scale genome. So you can clearly see the need to develop uh, faster and accurate uh, tools to analyze uh, the genomes uh, in a scalable way so that we can get the answers from everyone extremely quickly. Um, there are also some efforts essentially to build uh, and profile uh, 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 viral genomes, and also industries are coming into play. For example, RWAs is uh, uh, offering their uh, compute capabilities to to perform such computation in, in large scale. Uh, we may also perform city scale microbiome profiling. This means that we may collect samples from many regions uh, in a city. In this case, for example, a New York city and uh, perhaps you contain, uh, you collect samples from, let's say, a few thousand places. So this means that you actually need to, again, uh, sequence such a large uh, 
sample and understand it, whether it contains a harmful uh, uh, organism or not. Uh, uh, so essentially, I guess like having understanding uh, and a large scale uh, um, analysis is important. The other point is that the accurate analysis is also extremely important, right? Because we're making life critical decisions. And this is also important to improve the quality of life. So this is an example, perhaps, why an accurate analysis is important. So there was essentially a question of whether there's a plague in the New York City, a New York uh, subway system. And so plague is, as you may know, uh, uh, has killed uh, essentially uh, millions of people in Europe in the 14th century. Uh, it's also known as the Black Death uh, back in that time, and it's essentially extremely harmful for the for the human uh, lives. And once we were doing this uh, city scale uh, uh, genome analysis in New York City, uh, what researchers thought they found is that there could be uh, a samples of plague in the New York City sample, and this, of course, raised an extreme concern. Uh, for the people uh, living in the, in the New York City. But essentially, this, uh, people realized that this was essentially uh, a false information, not essentially uh, an incorrect analysis. And this was essentially referred as a failure of bioinformatics. But essentially, this only means that we just need to develop tools that are scalable and also accurate. So to give the right answer and also quickly, right? So we perhaps back in the day, we didn't have such tools that are scalable and also accurate to give these answers. And the issue essentially was uh, yeah, another sample that is not that harmful was essentially containing a similar uh, DNA strand. And then that's why uh, uh, people actually con were con uh, confused uh, and essentially thought that this particular uh, DNA region may be coming from a plague and uh, not other uh, genome. And to improve these tools, of course, right now we have uh, 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 benchmarking suits uh, and also uh, yearly done, almost yearly done uh, 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 benchmarking analysis. So this is, uh, basically a critical assessment of metagenome interpret, uh, interpretation analysis uh, or, or KAMI. Uh, and this is essentially like every year, uh, people are uh, submitting their tools to that competition, let's say, without knowing the sample. And the people uh, are testing each tool with the sample that they collect and then ranking each tool based on their accuracy performance and so on so that people can keep improving these tools uh, such that we'll have a fast and accurate analysis. So the other part of, I guess, the intelligent analysis is to use the right architecture uh, for performance and also reliable to reasons, right? So uh, so this is basically maybe non genomics related context, but you may think that perhaps when you're on a plane, you really don't want the plane let's say, to have a failure, right? To have a reliable, reliable the issues. Uh, but it may happen essentially. And our goal is to prevent that from happening. And this is essentially also the case in the genomic studies. Uh, we may be trying to analyze the genome in many different uh, uh, environments, including the other space, right? This is an example of, of uh, sample preparation and DNA sequencing, and in the in the other uh, space, uh, so it doesn't even mean that we're going to be analyzing the genome in the, in the in the on Earth, but we may also want to analyze it uh, in the space and even on Mars. So this is an example of the preparation, let's say, uh, of how we how we're getting prepared basically to collect samples from Mars and also to to sequence the samples that we collect from Mars, even on site, meaning on Mars. So there is an interesting uh, read, which was published a month ago 
so if you're interested, you can do this. But of course, the other question is we also want to use intelligent architectures, right? So we don't really want to, let's say, uh, uh, always use a general purpose machines, but find the right machine or find the right architecture to process our data extremely fast and accurately. Right? In this example, maybe we don't have uh, perhaps a server size uh, machine, or maybe we just have a mobile device with limited resource capabilities, right? And the question is, how can we co-design the architecture and algorithm so that we can do our analysis uh, on the mobile device? I guess the last point is uh, to remember is uh, DNA is a valuable asset to protect. And this has become even more important today because you may be aware that was this uh, recent uh, 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 data leakage from 23 and me uh, uh, company and 23 and me is essentially what they are doing. You're sending your uh, uh, DNA sample and then they are analyzing, they are sequencing and analyzing for you. But the question is, what happens with that data, right? So now they have your data, they have your perhaps the most valuable information, right? And in this case, uh, even worse, if this data is leaked for uh, I guess data leak data is leaked to to the individuals that have let's say not so good intentions. That's even more uh, perhaps scary and dangerous. And in this particular case, uh, uh, this uh, particular study uh, published in Washington Post is claiming that after the hack, it appeared that uh, these hackers were targeting people with uh, Jewish ancestry, right? So people are now wondering how to cut ties with the company, right? So that your, your data is not leaked. Even if it, is, if it is not leaked even now, they want to prevent that this data leakage so that they won't perhaps be targeted in the future. And of course, there are uh, some measurements that we're taking. There are some pri privacy pre preserving genome analysis that takes this issue into account, tries to protect your most valuable information. And basically, if you're interested, you can check this paper and even there are many other papers uh, taking this into account. And now even the companies are proposing or promising that uh, they perform the DNA testing by taking the privacy into account. So they are saying that we um, essentially we uh, 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 don't release or uh, make your data private uh, doing our analysis so that even if it is leaked, uh, hopefully it won't be visible to the hackers. So I guess this way you can understand uh, faster scalable and accurate genome analysis is extremely important for, for many reasons. And this is not even true for just genome analysis. This is true for many, many applications. And I guess the applications are only limited by our imagination right now. So for example, genome editing. Right now we can pinpoint uh, uh, a particular basis in your DNA and we can, let's say, cut those bases uh, in your DNA so that you can switch off the functionalities that you don't want. Or even maybe switch on certain functionalities. There are newer technologies that, will, uh, that let us to insert the bases that we want in the genome so that we can have the particular functionality. So this is extremely interesting, extremely exciting because it has a tremendous opportunity to lead up to significant things. And since this has, this is extremely interesting to do so, and this is programmable essentially, right? So you can literally program almost uh, to change almost any region in your genome. I'm saying almost there are some condition, conditions to do it, but let's say the, the fact that this is programmable, this is extremely interesting. And since, because of this, basically the opportunity, uh, the Nobel Prize was given to these uh, two individuals, uh, uh, Jennifer Dodna and Emmanuel Charpentier uh, got Nobel Prize award in 2020. And, um, and this was actually the product of the paper 
was that was released in 2011 or 2012. So imagine having Nobel Prize in eight years just because of how exciting it this is, right? How uh, how it can lead to bigger things, right? So this is this is basically very interesting. So other interesting uh, perhaps point is the DNA computing. So we don't now just use these digital machines or analog machines to perform computation for us. We can now also use DNAs to, to uh, provide some answers for some hard problems, let's say. So in this case, you may imagine a traveling, traveling salesman problem, right? So you have connections between cities and then you're wondering when you start from a particular state, can you end up, uh, can you basically visit every state, like maybe even once and then end up uh, in, in any other state. And what people are now doing is that they are actually encoding each city with a particular DNA strand such that uh, the, the connections between cities are also encoded at the, at the end uh, uh, position of these DNAs so that we can use the chemical structures, uh, meaning, uh, for example, when you have an encoding DNA encoding for Los Angeles and Dallas, they'll have this chemical uh, bond over here so that they can connect to each other because in, in our digital representation of this graph, they, they have a, a connection. And what you're wondering is basically, you have this graph, but you don't know the answer whether there's such a path basically, right? Uh, from one place to another place. And this is actually an MP hard problem. And what people, meaning, if you have, let's say, unlimited number of parallels, then perhaps you could find it in the point in real time, but in reality, you don't have such a parallelism. So what we're trying to do is that since DNA is offering us this huge level of parallelism, perhaps like millions of, level, uh, of, of parallel computations that can happen at a time, what people are doing is they are encoding the cities, representing the graph, and then letting the DNA work, it does its job, and essentially, if there is a, such a path, what will happen is that these cities will connect to each other with the chemical bonds. So not all of the DNA strands will connect to each other, but only the ones that is supposed to be connected to each other. And, and once you sequence, if you see a path from one position to another position, then maybe you can answer your telling salesman problem quite quickly, more perhaps more quickly than you would answer with a computer, a regular computer, let's say. Uh, there are also like other paradigms, for example, uh, you can even shop with your uh, DNA nowadays. Uh, so basically, I guess to wrap up achieving internal genome analysis is knowing how and where to enable past and accurate cheap price preserving and exabyte scale analysis of genomic data. So essentially, this is what we are trying to achieve in general. And this is this has been our dream basically since this was the dream also of, of the software research group. And uh, this is basically the idea is that building an embedded device that can perform comprehensive genome analysis in real time, maybe within a minute, right? Uh, to answer some important questions. And to achieve this, we should really uh, think of the entire uh, stack of the of of the uh, of the computer architecture, from the problem part perhaps even to the algorithms, even down to to the algor uh, the electrons. So we're not really perhaps for now very interested in electrons. Perhaps even interested in this part. But what's really important is to design all these steps over here together so that we can. Uh, uh, co-design algorithm and, and the hardware together to answer our questions quickly and efficiently. And if you're interested in basically learning more in this uh, topic in the context of genome analysis, this is our paper that was uh, presented uh, uh, in DAC this year. Uh, our paper is also available online. Uh, and also we know that there's a bright future for intelligent genome analysis because the sequencing machines are improving. We are designing intelligent architectures so it's almost a matter of time, let's say, to perhaps even achieve, achieve our goal. And I guess to uh, I guess give you a context of the steps in the in the in uh, like how genome analysis is done in real time. What we do is usually we collect the sample, right? Maybe it's a blood sample, it's a sample from somewhere in the city, etc. But we collect it, 
you prepare the sample, you, you purify it, you uh, amplify it, essentially. Uh, this is uh, a part of autodna sequencing. And you essentially, uh, what you do is that we, we have done the fragments of the DNA that the, that the sequencing machine takes such that it generates some data. So this data is not directly uh, ATGCs, but it's rather some raw sequencing data. So such a data can be electrical signals or it can be a set of images or a movie, depending on how the machine is designed to work, right? But the goal is basically is to understand that raw sequencing data and maybe either translate it to the basis or even without translating to the basis, perform some uh, computational analysis to understand the genome. And people are developing many tools for many steps in the genome analysis pipeline to achieve fast and accurate genome analysis. And this is essentially the general pipeline of, uh, of a regular genome analysis. It starts with sequencing, collecting the data, translating the signal perhaps optionally to, to the uh, human readable form, meaning ATGCs, and then identifying some differences and similarities uh, between sequencing data and some known uh, genome of a species, for example, reference genome, and again, figuring out what the differences are uh, based, on, based on your analysis. And next week, we're going to be starting with the first step, obtaining the sequencing data, how the sequencing machines work, and so on. Uh, uh, and in the coming weeks, we're going to be uh, covering the other steps. So with that, uh, this is basically the end of the lecture. Uh, I'll quickly check in case there are uh, any questions on YouTube. Uh, if there are, I'll, I'll try to answer them. Um, so uh, I think there is one question by uh, Stanislav. Uh, I'm sorry if I saw this question uh, a little bit late, uh, but if you are still around, I'll answer it. Yes, the go so the question is, uh, the whole genome sequencing, does it mean analysis of all uh, 3.2 billion bases? So in the, in the case of uh, human, yes. So the whole genome uh, sequencing literally means that Whatever the organism that you work, you want to work on, let's say it's a bacteria, it's a human, it's zebrafish, something else, uh, you are interested in uh, getting the information from the entire gene, meaning from all chromosomes, even perhaps including the micro, uh, mitochondrial uh, DNA. Uh, there is another type of, there are actually several types of uh, sequencing. But there's another type of, uh, let's say, uh, sequencing, which is known as whole exome sequencing. So in this case, you are actually interested in, in the parts uh, that are known as uh, exons. So those exons are, that they make up, let's say, genes that are particularly responsible for the, how the proteins are, let's say, synthesized and generated. So if you are just interested in basically the gene locations, uh, there are some other preparation mechanisms that will literally, let's say, delete everywhere in your genome, but uh, the, the surrounding regions of these exons so that you can only sequence uh, that part. So this is also known as a whole exon sequence. Uh, I hope I was able to uh, answer your question. Uh, uh, and uh, I don't see any other questions. Um, so with that, uh, I'll I'll uh, I'll finish uh, the lecture. So thanks everyone. Uh, I'll see you next week.